Yesterday, John McCain died of brain cancer, and for the last 24 hours or so, we've been inundated with constant articles and videos about John McCain and his legacy, so I figured why not be part of the flood. So today what I'd like to do is take a look at John McCain's legacy and see if his reputation for being a maverick is deserved, while also sort of contextualizing him in the political era in which he operated, namely the neoliberal era. And what I will show in the end is that McCain was actually pretty typical of this era, and that the only things that ever made him stand out in any way were his personality and his ability to really capitalize on situations in order to put his name out there and attract attention. So let's take a look at John McCain and how he should be remembered. To fully understand John McCain's place in American political history, we really need to take a look at the era in which he operated, namely the neoliberal era of American politics. This era began around 1980 or so. You could actually backdate it a few years to about the middle of Jimmy Carter's administration, but 1980 seems to be the year that most people agree upon. And the basic characteristic of the neoliberal era is that both parties reached a new consensus which definitively replaced the New Deal consensus. And in this new neoliberal consensus, what we see is that both parties agree on the direction of economic and foreign policy, with most of the disagreements being relatively minor. So what do I mean by that? Well, both parties agree to push free trade deals. Both parties agree that the rights of corporations should be valued above the rights of unions and that corporate tax rates should be kept low. Both parties agree to forego any kind of radical environmental legislation. Both parties agree that we should have a large military budget that is by far bigger than any other country. And both parties are in favor of foreign interventions. The disagreements of this period are basically whether we actively kill unions as the Republicans want to do, or we just let them wither on the vine after free trade deals, which is essentially the democratic position. Do we gradually increase the minimum wage without actually keeping pace with inflation or creating a living wage as the Democrats want to do, or do we just let the minimum wage remain stagnant as the Republicans want to do? Do we leave Social Security alone without really enhancing or protecting it as the Democrats want to do, or do we raid the trust fund and possibly privatize it as the Republicans want to do? Basically, what it boils down to are differences in degrees of privatization and degrees of deregulation, but both parties accept the same basic premises. It's actually amazing how fierce the fighting has been given how low the stakes are and how both sides share mostly the same assumptions. And also when I was talking about privatizing Social Security, one of my major grievances with Obama is that one of his grand bargain deals actually aimed at privatizing Social Security and fortunately that deal did fall through. So at any rate, the point is that every president from Reagan until Trump has had largely the same views when, it really, when you really boil it down to what matters. And a lot of the other disagreements the parties have had have been on social issues like abortion and gay marriage. At any rate, the consequence of the neoliberal consensus can really be seen on the graph to your right, where the richer you are, the better off you've done, under a neoliberal administration. And for the most part, what it boils down to is if you're in the top 10% of Americans, you have done well, and the higher up you are among that 10%, the better you've done. However, if you're in the bottom 90%, especially the bottom 50%, well, you haven't done very well at all, and in many cases, you've seen regression rather than progress. So this means that we've had poorly framed debates where people have not really been debating anything that moves the country forward. We haven't really been addressing, say, climate change in terms that make sense. We've been talking about should we regulate uh, CO2 emissions uh, while stifling the economy. Uh, we've had a lot of debates that are very poorly framed and not productive. We've also valued discourse above action, despite the fact that these debates have been very poorly framed they still, we, we've had the um, unfortunate side effect that a lot of politicians and people evaluating politicians have valued speech above action. 
So, for instance, as we'll talk about, a lot of what McCain is famous for are things that he said rather than things that he's done. And you could say the same for Obama and many other people who are praised in the mainstream media. There are people who have said the right things but may not have actually done a hell of a lot. And because of this combination of us having poorly framed debates and really valuing speech above action, we have gotten to a point where all of the policy outcomes are skewed heavily toward the elite, as seen on the graph to your right. And this whole idea of basically appeasing the rich and ignoring everyone else means that what used to be considered corruption has become institutionalized as normal, everyday business. Now, when we look at McCain's role in all this, he had some good moments here and there, especially his uh, last stand in 2017 where he came in and killed the skinny repeal of Obamacare, and he was never at any point the worst person in the Senate. But he also wasn't really a maverick, nor was he a statesman who transcended party or really called out the major underlying social problems in America and really tried to address them in any meaningful way. So let's get into how McCain operated within the system and what his sort of model for taking action was. Back in 2008, when John McCain was a presidential candidate, I was talking extensively on Facebook with some of my Republican friends from Kansas, and they were trying to convince me that John McCain was the most selfless man in American politics, and that he was someone who consistently put country above party, etc., etc. However, when I looked at the actual pattern of his political behavior, I was far from convinced. Here's what I saw when I saw McCain take maverick stands. There were always three conditions that would be met when he would act out. One, he would buck the party line in a way that wouldn't cost his corporate donors a dime. Name a time when McCain has acted in a way that was economically populist, for instance, or that mandated that corporations spend money to ensure the betterment of American society. You probably can't do it. Two, his maverick moments were timed in such a way as to draw attention. Part of the reason why McCain has the reputation of a maverick is because if you think about the times that he has done maverick moves, all of these things have been advertised. By comparison, a lot of other politicians who maybe are just less skilled as politicians um, have done plenty of maverick things that have gone under the radar. For instance, most Americans had no idea that Bernie Sanders was such a maverick when it came to his actions within the Democratic caucus until he ran for president in 2016 and got a lot of attention. But he did all kinds of maverick things, they just didn't quite get advertised. There's also a media bias uh, built into that where McCain was an establishment guy who could get all this attention, whereas Bernie Sanders was an outsider from a small state who hadn't run for president at that time. Anyway, that's... Uh, a little bit of a side issue. But the third characteristic of all McCain's maverick moments is that they tended to happen against people he had a personal grudge with and it helped to enhance his own uh, persona while damaging someone he felt aggrieved by. And he would always save it for that right moment where he could do some damage to that person and get even with them. And I think that when we look at the examples of his Maverick moments, we'll see that they adhere pretty closely to this little model that I've set up here. Some other characteristics of McCain's politics is that he often claimed to uphold bipartisanship, civility, and decency, all three of which are words that don't mean much. He also rarely followed up his Maverick moves with actual legislation, which again is a characteristic of the neoliberal era, where we spend a lot of time talking about what people say and not enough time talking about what they do and how they vote. So let's look at McCain's actual voting record before we assign him the title of Maverick. However, there is one other thing we need to consider. Um, for a Maverick, it's kind of weird that John McCain is a rank-and-file neoconservative. So let's take a look at his neoconservative credentials. It's fairly difficult to define what the line is between a neoliberal and a neoconservative. If I had to do it, what I would say is that the main difference is that whereas neoliberals 
like Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama tend to be socially left and focus a lot on discourse and professionalism, political correctness, all that kind of stuff. Neoconservatives kind of throw that out the window a bit. They sometimes come off as rough around the edges or they have sort of a cowboy persona like Bush or a rancher thing going for them like Dick Cheney. At heart, they're still basically the same. The other difference is that whereas when a neoliberal talks about foreign aggression, they couch it in terms of, say, geopolitics. They come off as very professional, and they talk about all the professional people they've talked to who agree with them, whereas neoconservatives talk about being tough and the flag and love of country. But ultimately, they're all talking about the same thing. And John McCain is, I think, a little more in the neoconservative than the neoliberal camp. Uh, the other thing about neoconservatives and neoliberals is that whereas we normally associate neoliberals with left social views, there are people like Joe Manchin who are clearly not leftist, who would still fall under the heading of neoliberal. And with John McCain, even though he espoused some conservative social views, he's not really socially conservative. I think he really just doesn't give a shit in general about social issues at all. And if we look at his voting record, it's pretty clear that he went right along with the general consensus of the neoconservatives and neoliberals. Uh, so if he was a maverick, then apparently he chose not to be a maverick on the overall direction of the country. He consistently voted in favor of war, intervention, increasing military spending. Economically, he supported NAFTA and CAFTA, two of the trade agreements that helped build up the backlash that caused Trump to carry the Midwest. McCain also supported the graham leach bliley Act, which helped to do it with Glass-Steagall and deregulated the banking industry that helped to lead to the financial collapse of 2007 and 8. Uh, he was in favor of the Estate Tax Elimination Act of 2000. That's more of a Republican thing, um, where the idea was that if you're rich, you shouldn't be taxed for what you inherit. Um, that's sort of a pet cause of the Republicans of the 90s. He was in favor of the Bush tax cuts and the Trump tax cuts. And by the way, just to go back to Graham Leach Bliley for a minute, almost all the Democrats voted against it, but it was signed into law by Bill Clinton, who in due time we will talk about and discover that he was the classic neoliberal and the person who is most responsible for bringing the Democrats into full submission to the vision laid out by Ronald Reagan. At any rate, um, I think that you can see here clearly that McCain is well within the norms for a neoliberal or a neoconservative, depending on which term you choose to apply to him and that he was not in any substantive disagreement with people like George W. Bush, despite the fact that they actually hated each other on a personal level. Sometimes John McCain would speak out and say the right thing, only to fail to follow through with his observation or his claim and let the issue go. One example is when he was running for president in 2000. He spoke out against the tax cuts for the wealthy that Bush was proposing, and he pointed out that rising inequality was creating a big gap between Americans, especially between white people and people of color. And that was true. It was statistically verifiable, as it still is. The trend has not changed, and McCain was aware of this in 2000 and still had to be aware of it later on, yet he quit talking about it. Not only did he quit talking about it, but when Bush proposed his tax cuts in 2001 and then Trump proposed his tax cuts, McCain voted for both of those series of tax cuts, even though he said that he knew that these things were wrong and that they would only further exacerbate the growing problem of inequality. During the Bush years, McCain really came into his own. He visited all the late night shows like uh, Jon Stewart's Daily Show and Stephen Colbert's Colbert Report, and he would talk about how um, the Bush administration was full of shit when they talked about enhanced interrogation and that it was just simply torture, and how he could personally testify to the fact that torture is morally reprehensible. Yet, when it came time to actually craft legislation to roll back maybe part of the Patriot Act, or to set standards on what kind of techniques American um, interrogators could use, John McCain was noticeably absent. 
And the problem with him going ghost on this is that without his support, he was the chief opponent of, ter of torture in terms of having uh, a moral high ground and being able to speak from experience. This wasn't going to happen. So by his absence, McCain was effectively excusing torture. Um, so his moral cur courage failed him when it counted the most. He was able to go on TV and talk about how it was unjust, but he couldn't actually bring himself to craft legislation which would deal with the problem. Also, um, early on in the Obama years, he spoke out against fighting a, uh, spoke out about fighting against fossil fuel dependency. And part of what he wanted to do was to gain Democratic support by investing in alternative energy. And I believe it was he and Joe Lieberman who were crafting a bill. However, this happened at the same time as the Tea Party movement, and a lot of people from the right threatened to give him a primary challenger if he went through with this, so McCain let the bill drop, and it never came to fruition. But again, because there was a Democratic supermajority, had McCain gone maverick and done what he thought was right, this could have happened, and it would have really burnished his record. If you had combined a major bill on energy independence and producing alternative energy with McCain-Feingold, that would be a pretty decent record that you could retire with and be happy about. But McCain's main goal is to stay in office, so he backed down from this and then just voted against pretty much everything Obama did for the next eight years. Um, so he was not a maverick at all when it came to falling in line with Mitch McConnell's strategy of defeating everything that Obama tried to do. For the most part, when it came to voting with his party against the initiatives of Democratic presidents like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, John McCain was a rank-and-file Republican who did not deviate from the norm at all. When he did choose to play the maverick, it was only against his own presidents, Reagan, Bush, and Trump. So let's look at the circumstances of when he decided to play at Maverick and when he was able to gain attention for himself. In 1983, he was a, I believe, first-term congressman from uh, Arizona, and he opposed Reagan's intervention in Lebanon. This was something that most Republicans didn't do. And I think that a lot of his reason for opposing Reagan at this time is because Reagan had just gotten his ass kicked in the 1982 midterms and looked very vulnerable. Had Reagan looked stronger, I seriously doubt that the freshman Congressman McCain would have spoken out even if he still held the same views that our intervention in Lebanon was not a good idea. Later on, when Bush and his cronies were arguing for enhanced interrogation and talking about how it isn't torture, McCain, of course, famously called it torture and exposed them. However, um, he only did this, I believe, in part because he did not like George W. Bush. And the reason I say that is because, remember, we talked about how there was no follow-through. He never helped the craft legislation to get rid of this abuse. So I think that a lot of it is that he wanted to portray George Bush as a brutal barbarian and to have other people view him as uncivil and dishonorable in the same way that he viewed him for what had happened during the 2000 primary. Um... If McCain truly did feel that torture was deeply immoral, I believe he would have done more to try to end the practice through legislation, but he didn't, which is why I think it was mostly a personal vendetta against George W. Bush. In 2017, he almost single-handedly shot down the ACA skinny repeal, and do I even need to say it? I think his main motive here was because he really hates Donald Trump. Um, Trump, of course, made fun of the fact that McCain was captured in Vietnam and said that he prefers his war heroes who weren't captured. And uh, McCain still held a severe grudge against Trump till the day that he died. And one of his last instructions in life was that he did not want Trump to attend his funeral. So, uh, you know, McCain had a definite petty streak, and I think that it came out a lot. And that he, what he would do is wait for his opponent to reach a low point when they really needed his support and then to screw them over in order to exact his revenge. He put his own personal feelings a lot of times ahead of what he may have thought was the best move. And in the case of 2017's ACA vote, I think he actually acted in the public interest, but I don't think that he did it for the reasons that a lot of McCain supporters or Democrats who think that McCain was sort of the last lion of the Senate 
think. I think it was much more personal and much more about his vendetta with Trump than about public duty or the public good. One part of the McCain myth is that he was always above suspicion and corruption and that he was a statesman who never fell prey to the ways of Washington. And it is completely untrue. So McCain had served a few terms in the House, and then he was elected to the Senate, and his first real action in the Senate, the first thing that got him national attention, was when he was involved in the Keating Five scandal. So what happened is that McCain and four other senators intervened on behalf of Charles H. Keating Jr., who was under investigation by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board in 1989. And... What happened is that there was a hearing, and this was supposed to be a hearing between an executive office and this banker. However, five senators showed up, and they said that they were there to make sure that their good friend and this great patriot wasn't going to be harassed or unduly punished by this board. So they exerted their influence in an unjust and heavy-handed way to make sure that their friend Keating would get off. And the, part of the reason they did this, pretty obviously, all five of them had received substantial campaign contributions from Mr. Keating. However, that same year, Keating's company, Lincoln Savings and Loan Association, collapsed, and it left the federal government, i.e. you and me, the taxpayers, on the hook for $3.4 billion. This was part of the savings and loan scandal. It also left 23,000 bondholders defrauded, and for some investors who had in invested literally everything into Lincoln Savings and Loan, they lost their life savings. So this was pretty damn bad. And for two years, the Senate Ethics Committee investigated the five senators involved. And in the end, McCain was finally cleared. They said that he had exercised bad judgment, but that he had not been guilty of undue influence. John Glenn, a Democrat from Ohio, was also cleared. And you'll notice something about the two guys who were cleared versus the three guys who were not. Now, McCain and Glenn are both considered national heroes. McCain was in a Vietnamese prison camp for several years, uh, suffered horribly, refused special treatment to get released early, and then John Glenn was an astronaut. So, because they were national heroes, they were held to a different standard than the other three who were just kind of random Democrats. Also, uh, this is yet another example of McCain's bipartisanship, and another example of why bipartisanship does not necessarily mean good. Um, people can work together across the aisle for things that are really fucked up, like exerting undue influence to help out a banker slash donor for no reason against the public interest. Anyway, um, if we look at the details, though, it's pretty clear that McCain was guilty. And actually, in his autobiography, he said that getting involved in the Keating hearing was the greatest mistake of his career. He had received $112,000 from Keating between 1982 and 1987. On the other hand, his wife Cindy and her father had invested $360,000 in a Keating shopping center the year before the hearing in 1986. And I believe that McCain paid back a lot of the money that Keating had um, paid to his campaign over time. Um, and, you know, most of his dealings were more honorable than this, but it just goes to show you that McCain was very much a creature of his time and that he did not object to the fundamental direction of the country where it was a club for elites at the expense of everyone else. Part of the reason why McCain earned a reputation for being an honorable bipartisan senator is because of his work on the McCain-Feingold Act of 2002. At that time, there was a rising tide of what is known as soft money, which is where someone will donate a ton of money to a party apparatus at the national level and earmark the funds for local and state races to get around caps on those races. So what McCain and Senator Russ Feingold from Wisconsin decided to do was to put a cap on that soft money. So uh, this was responding to an actual public problem, and it seemed like a good piece of legislation. The main lasting effect of the bill that is still in place is that there is a limit on soft money and parties don't have quite the same level of control or clout that they had under the old system of soft money. That being said, um, one part of the legislation that was overturned by Citizens United was 
may be just as important, if not more so, and that part of the legislation banned issue advocacy ads, which named the federal candidate within 30 days of a primary or caucus, or banned the same ads within 60 days of a general election, and it also prohibited ads paid for directly by corporations, nonprofits, and unions. So this was a good piece of legislation, don't get me wrong, but it didn't quite get to the heart of the matter of money in politics. Soft money is only one form of money that goes into politics. So by cutting off the parties, what happened is that PACs and super PACs got those funds instead, and it wasn't really a major solution, and it certainly wasn't a structural fix for a structural problem. So I give McCain a lot of credit for being involved in this, but at the same time, um, this was a totally inadequate response to a major problem, and if he really wanted to go down as one of the greatest statesmen in American history, he'd have to go quite a bit further and deal with the problem uh, much more effectively to earn that kind of reputation. During the New Deal era, it was common for both parties to have people of varying ideological commitments and for different senators and representatives to vote according to their ideological dispositions on different issues rather than strictly along party lines. However, despite the fact that the ideological field has narrowed so much during the neoliberal era, party line voting has become much more common. So as the stakes have become lower, essentially, the fierceness with which those stakes are contested has actually increased. And one of the reasons why McCain seems like a maverick is because he hasn't really changed over that period of time. Now, back in the 80s, when it was still common for people to vote on issue coalitions, McCain was a very reliable uh, Republican, and because of that, he was considered to be a conservative. However, when he only maintained his 90% voting rate going into a period when people were up to 95 on average, he was now viewed as a moderate. So there really wasn't a lot of change for McCain, it's just that the country as a whole and the party both moved to the right and he just stayed on the center right. I would also say that this voting pattern is probably more important than McCain's actual voting because what this does is this really something that helps to illustrate the neoliberal era's limited choices and the kabuki theater that goes along with it. Um, also, I'd point out that the party apparatuses have done a lot more to vet candidates in recent years, despite the idea that we have that these primaries really open up the process. Both parties really try to sort out anyone who would effectively challenge the status quo. The Republicans weren't able to hold back a lot of the Tea Party people, but at the end of the day, Tea Party people are still very pro-corporate, so they don't really upset the apple cart. Democrats have gone way out of their way to make sure that progressives don't get into office, however, and they've even engaged in election fraud to prevent progressives from winning races, as happened in, I believe it was the 3rd District of Kansas where Brent Welder was ahead, and then there was a mysterious glitch in the voting machines, and several hours later the computer unglitched and his establishment opponent was the winner. Mysterious to say the least, and highly, highly suspect. The final question that I want to broach is whether or not we should mourn the passing of John McCain. McCain was a big name, but when we really look at what he did, he really didn't have a big impact on policy if we consider how long he was in service and how famous he was. Much of McCain's maverick reputation was built on concerted PR surrounding a few isolated high-profile moments which, again, didn't have a major impact on policy. This supposed great statesman watched problems develop and watched them worsen without really ever attempting to do much outside of McCain-Feingold in 2002. He knew about inequality. He knew about it just as well as someone like Bernie Sanders, but he never actually did anything to address it. I think that's pretty damning. McCain's career as a whole is a great illustration of why the neoliberal era is politically unproductive. This is someone who spent a lot more time worrying about whether he came off as decent and good rather than going out and attempting to be decent and good. He didn't really do anything to make the country a better place. 
And for that, I don't think he deserves our mourning. The only reason why we should even consider mourning is because there's a very good possibility that whoever replaces John McCain will be worse. But aside from that, I don't really see any reason to regret his passing in any meaningful way. He didn't really give us a hell of a lot, so we don't owe him anything.